Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mark Moss Show where we talk about the decentralized revolution. I talk about these each and every week. Hopefully you're catching on by now. The world is changing. It's changing rapidly before our very eyes. A lot of people don't understand why there's so much... Uh, seems like the world's kind of coming to an end, right? Everybody's at each other's throat. Talks of civil war in the United States. Nations are collapsing all around us right now. Sri Lanka and Lebanon and Peru and Ecuador. I mean, it's just they're dropping like flies. Like, what is going on? Well, that's what's going on. The decentralized revolution. The world has peaked out at peak centralization and it's reversing course. The financial system in the United States has fallen apart. And uh, today we saw this, or this week we saw... Um, another record of inflation. So everywhere we look, the banks are running out of money in China. <laughs> uh, like I said, all these nations are collapsing. Um, the EU is on the verge of collapsing. Um, and even in the United States, uh, inflation just continues to rage on. Now, I just did this really cool video on my main uh, YouTube channel. Just search Mark Moss YouTube, and you can find this video I did talking about how um, Europe, the European Union, is on the verge of collapsing. Uh, so if you want to check that out, go go search out my YouTube channel, Mark Moss, and I think it's the last video I did. Uh, but in the United States, things are not looking so good, and that's because we saw another CPI reading at another higher number. Now, this is bad for the United States. It's bad for your Bitcoin, your cryptocurrency. It's bad for your stocks. It's bad for your assets. But it's also really bad for emerging markets. So let me explain to you what is going on. Now, if you haven't heard the news, if you weren't paying attention, the U.S. inflation gauge, which is CPI, um, hit another four-decade high of 9.1%. Oh, man, I've been calling it nine for a while because it was 8.6. So I just kind of like rounded up. Um, but 9.1. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that's completely false. So for example, I use this, I, I, I call the CPI, which is the consumer price index, I call it CP lie. Uh, because that's because they manipulate it so much to basically show whatever number they want. And so the way it's supposed to work, uh, bear with me for a second if you already know, but it's supposed to represent a basket of goods. So if you went to the grocery store and you bought a basket of goods um, in the 80s, then you went back over time and you kept buying the same basket of goods, it would track that. So it could basically uh, track somebody's uh, quality of living. The problem is they've changed that so many times, so they'll do substitutions. So for example, you used to be able to eat steak at every meal, and now you have to eat tofu or something like that, right? They, they downgraded to a hamburger meat and then downgraded to turkey meat and then downgraded to tofu. So you can still live. You're just not eating steak every day, for example. Other thing they do is they'll do like, um, if things improve, like, uh, like, uh, your gas, your gasoline, um, they put new additives in there. So it's better for your engine. So since it improved, they don't count the cost increase of gasoline. Well, gasoline went up big time. So you can see how heavy manipulated that number is. Another one they do is that uh, obviously home prices have gone up crazy in, in a lot of areas across the United States, 100% in some areas, but yet they don't track the price of a home. What they do is they track something called the rent owner's equivalent. And so they do some uh, random survey supposedly and ask homeowners uh, what they think they could rent their house for. Now, they didn't ask me. Uh, I don't know who they asked, and they're not asking experts like uh, what they think they could rent their house for. What they should be doing maybe instead is just looking at the statistics for rent. That might be better. But anyway, uh, many reasons why it's manipulated. Now, thing I want to point out before we jump into this is that uh, they really overhauled the CPI measurement in the 80s, and they really overhauled it again in the 90s. If we go back and measure inflation as we did in the 80s, we're at 17 or 18 percent, not 9 percent. And so the reason why that's important to understand just before we dive into this is because they're saying that we haven't seen this number in four decades. But I would argue that when we saw this number four decades ago, it was at a real number, and we're probably double what that highest point was back then. But uh, so what happened? So uh, new CPI inflation, uh, inflation's out of control. Uh, average person can't afford food. They can't afford to travel. They can't afford uh, gasoline. They can't afford to take a trip, all these things. Um, and stocks are down, Bitcoin's down, cryptocurrency's down. Like what the heck is going on? 
Well, that's what I want to break down for you today so you can understand exactly what's going on. <clears throat> now, like I said, it was at 8.6. It was at you know 8.4, then 8.6, and now 9.1. And you probably already know by now <clears throat> that the central bank, the Federal Reserve, is committed. They have vowed to bring inflation down. Now, <clears throat> to... I say this all the time. If you tune in, tune in with me each and every week, I apologize for sounding like a broken record. But infl- measuring uh, or or the definition of inflation being prices going up, consumer price inflation, is a little bit, uh, in my opinion, it's the wrong way to talk about it. Under the Austrian economics viewpoint, inflation is when the monetary supply increases. Prices going up are just the result of that. But there's all types of prices, and there's all types of reasons why those prices can go up and down. Um, but the Fed's committed to bringing them down. How can the Fed that controls monetary supply, their mandates are stable prices and full employment, um, their tools that they have are basically Fed funds, right? Interest rates, they can set that. Uh, But how are they going to affect the price of bread or Chipotle or gasoline or my airline ticket, or my toothbrush, like, uh, you know, oil for my motorcycle. Um, How can they affect the price of all of those things when all they have is the Fed funds rate to set that, which is the interest rate that the banks get charged, but the banks create the money by lending it out, and the banks can charge whatever interest rate they want. So the Fed can't force the banks to create money by lending it, nor can they adjust the interest rate that the banks charge. All they can do is adjust the interest rate that they charge the banks. But the banks get to set their own rate, and then they get to make the spread. So the Fed could move the rate really low, and the banks could still keep the rate high, and they could make that whole spread, the arbitrage. Or the Fed could raise their rates, and the banks could leave it where it is. So they're trying to adjust the price of everything, a bottle of water, a bottle of soda, a sandwich at the local shop, uh, how much I pay for my um, Zoom subscription. They're trying to change the price of all those things, by adjusting the interest rate, the Fed funds rate, which doesn't even affect the banks lending money out or what they charge. Seems kind of uh, crazy, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. But anyway, uh, they're not going to stop trying. Let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They vowed to bring the price down. Now, uh, as I've been talking about we, each and every week, they can't really do it. <laughs> There's nothing they can do. The only thing they can really do is they can try to crush the demand. So if we want to adjust prices, there's two things. We can increase the supply or we can adjust, we can lower the demand. And they're lowering the demand of that. So why is it that when inflation hit 9.1% this week, the CPI, we saw the Bitcoin price tumble down a little bit, which it's back up to where it was before. We saw stocks going down. Why is that? Because I thought Bitcoin was supposed to be an inflation hedge. So if we have high inflation, shouldn't the price of Bitcoin be going up? That doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Well, it does if you kind of understand how this all works. So I want to explain that to you. Um, I want to show you um, what we can see about uh, stocks and Bitcoin, um, some some, uh, Google search results, what those mean. We're going to talk about uh, when I was asked on Fox Business, when do I think Bitcoin will get back on track? Not exactly sure what that question meant, but we're going to talk about when new all-time highs could come back, uh, when the bottom might might be in, and so much more. I was talking about how this week we saw the um, new numbers come out from the U.S. government, uh, the U.S., the BLS puts them out, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they said that the the CPI, Consumer Price Index, rose again to another record of 9.1%. But if, uh, if it went high, if, if we still have inflation raging, why did Bitcoin move down off of that move, which is pretty interesting? Um, not, only did, not only did that happen, we saw stocks come down as well, um, which is weird because, like I said, it's supposed to be an inflation hedge for some traders. But the June price data seemed to signal something else. Now, it looks like that maybe what's happening is that because inflation is continuing to rage on, 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 and on, the Federal Reserve 
is committed. They vow to bring it back under control. And again, all they have at their disposal, the only tool they have is to adjust the interest rates. And so what happened is because of that high inflation print, so because they're vowed to get that number down, the Fed needs to see steady progress. So we need to have gone from 8.6 to 8.2 to 7.8 to 7.2 to 6. You get, the, you get the idea. We need to be trending down. The problem is that we're still trending up. Now, the Fed has been raising rates, raising rates, raising rates. As a matter of fact, at their last round of raising rates, they actually raised rates more than what the market had anticipated. So they are being even more aggressive than many people thought they would. But no matter how aggressive, no matter how much more aggressive they've been than what people thought they would be, still not taking a dent out of inflation. So because it's continued to go up, they haven't, it hasn't even stayed the same, much less gone down. It actually went up, and it went up by a pretty big chunk. I mean, from 8.6 to 9.1, that's a, that's a big leap forward. And so um, the fear is, the reason why the market reacted the way it did is because they're saying, well, shoot, if the Fed hasn't been able to get the rates to move down, and here we are again at a new record, they are going to have to be even more aggressive than anybody thought they would be. And uh, people realize that the Fed, they don't really have any tools to get to a perfect number. They were trying to get to 2% inflation. Uh, they couldn't get to two, they, we had no inflation. They wanted to get it up, get it up, get it up to two, get it to two. Then they said, shoot, well, we can't get to two. Let's, let's, let's see if we can get it to four. And they overshot to nine. So now they want to get it back down to two. Ooh, and uh, do you think they're gonna land at two? They'll probably end up at negative two. And so the market's going, well, shoot, now uh, they're going to way overreact. They're going to go way farther than they should have because they have no control. And uh, we think that they are going to crash the markets. That's basically what the markets are saying. And so it says here that uh, the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, is scheduled to meet in uh, July 26th to 27th here at the end of the month, a couple more weeks, to discuss further monetary tightening, meaning well, let's uh, restrict the money supply even more. Now, remember, the booms and busts come from the Fed increasing the money supply and decreasing the money supply. So uh, they create the booms and the busts. Uh, it's not, uh, they are natural market cycles. They get exaggerated because of the Fed. Um, and so that's what they want to do. They want to tighten, so they'll crash the markets even more. Um, and this new CPI number gives the central bankers a green light for another quote-unquote aggressive rate hike. Now, I love this quote from Fed Chair Jerome Powell, quote, is there a risk we would go too far? Certainly there's a risk. <laughs> That's like the understatement, right? Uh, is there a risk we'll go too far? They always go too far. They couldn't get to 2%. They couldn't get it up. We can't get it. We can't get to, we can't get, okay, we're, we're going to overshoot. They said, well, quote, let it run hot. Meaning they are, well, if we get to four or five, we'll, we'll, we'll blend that in with the average of being less than two. And we'll end up with like an, a blended and average rate of two, three. We'll call that good. They got nine. Is there a risk we'll go too far? Certainly there's a risk. That's Jerome Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve. That's what he said. Yes, there's a risk. Of course, they always go too far. And so they way overshot it. And then the only, the only tool they have is to destroy demand, crush the stock market, crush cryptocurrencies, crush the job market, crush the economy. Then people won't spend money. They'll be too broke. And that will cause prices to come down, maybe. Now, I tend to think that they could actually cause prices to go up even more by doing that. Um, that's a different topic for a different day. Uh, but it says here, um, he was asked that at a, re at, a, at a recent conference at the European Central Bank Forum, and they said, quote, the bigger mistake to make, let's put it that way, would be to fail to restore price stability. So um, he says that, uh, you know, we could go too far. Certainly there's a risk, but that, that's an okay risk. The bigger risk would be um, that we fail to restore price stability. Hmm. So by having prices go up through the roof and then crashing them all the way back down too far, does that sound stable? <laughs> it certainly doesn't sound stable to me. I don't know what his definition of stable is. To me, stable means like it doesn't change very often, or when it does change, it doesn't change by very much. Uh, but here they are way overshooting to one side and way undershooting to the other. And um, that's the greater risk. Uh, I, just, I, just, I just don't understand with these guys. Now, um, like I said, there's a lot of factors uh, why this happens, um, but we can see here there was an article I saw on Bloomberg that says stocks need to fall more 
to price in the hit of a U.S. recession. So what they're saying is that the S&P 500 needs to be at 3586 to get this downturn uh, priced in. So what? how far is that? 3586. I didn't have this chart up, but I'm going to pull it up real quick. Don't worry. I'm quick here. So 3586 would represent a... 35, uh, uh, another 6% drop or so, um, which doesn't sound like a lot if you look, look at cryptocurrency charts, um, but it's a pretty big deal. 6% considering how far are we off the high? We're at 20% off the high right now. So um, it's, it's, more, it's about 30% more from where we've already fallen. It's a pretty big deal. And, and again, like I said, the Fed has already told us their, their role here is to crush demand due to something known as the wealth effect. So when your retirement account goes up and your home goes up in value, even though you're not going to retire for whatever, 20, 30 years, even though you're not going to sell your home, you feel more wealthy. So you spend more money. When your retirement account and your home goes down in value, even though you're not going to sell, it's the, res it's the reverse of the wealth effect, meaning you feel poor and the poor effect, we'll call it that. And so you spend less. And so they're trying to bring this down. They're trying to get to the point where investors are scared and they won't spend money. And that's, and so it looks like the Fed got this new inflation print number. They were hoping it would come lower, but it didn't. And because it went so much higher, uh, we're looking for potentially an overreaction. Now, how much of an overreaction could we get? And what would that mean? What would that mean for stocks? What would it mean for Bitcoin? What would it mean for cryptocurrencies? I'm going to come back and I'm going to tell you what I think could happen. Basically, what they're assuming is that the feds aren't, they've already been having bigger raises, raise, bigger raises of the Fed funds rate than they had even anticipated. And it's not having any effect. Um, now, uh, one one clip, I don't have it ready, but uh, I saw the, the, the new White House press secretary. She came out yesterday with a video. So uh, the, <laughs> the White House already knew this data was coming out. Uh, they, and the day before the CPI inflation was uh, numbers were, were released, she was out already talking it down. And she said, don't worry, don't worry, you know. Um, this is old data and, uh, you know, the markets have moved a lot since this data came out. And so, um, well, it's bad. It's going to be bad. Um, don't worry. Um, it's actually not as bad as it looks because the data has moved a lot. It's changed a lot since we put those numbers out and anybody believes that I got a bridge to sell you as well. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, I hit me up on social media cause I, I got bridges I need to sell. Uh, but, uh, so it's, it's way worse. And so now it's like, well, shoot, they've been overreacting. They haven't been able to get it down. And so they're going to overreact even more. Now, I've been saying that they're trying, to, they're trying to get this reverse wealth effect, right? We could potentially see inflation go up even higher from that. So, for example, let's say that um, they, the, they destroy the, the, the wealth effect, reverse wealth effect goes into effect, and... and um, I feel so broke now. I can't afford to work. I can't afford to fill up my car with gas and drive every day. I can't afford to get childcare. I can't afford to eat out, whatever it is, right? So I'm going to quit my job and I'll just have the government give me welfare, right? I'll just live off the government. Well, now what happens to that employer? Well, that employer now lost workers. And so now they're going to have to hire new workers and they may have to pay a higher rate in order to get more workers. If they have to pay a higher rate, then the pricing of their products and services are going to go up. Um, what else? Well, let's say that those workers that decided to quit their job worked at gas refineries. And now the gas refineries or the airlines or the food processing plants have less workers. And so now they're not able to get out as much gasoline or they're not able to get out as much food or not able to move as many flights. And so then the companies would have to raise their prices to make up for that. We'd have less supply, that shortages. See how that works? Now, I'm not saying that's guaranteed to happen, but it certainly could. You can easily understand how that could happen. And this goes back again to the insanity of thinking that you can change the price on everything from this mug to this remote to this computer mouse to this coffee mug to this monitor I'm looking at to this microphone. I can change the price of all this stuff based off of the Fed adjusting the interest rates. 
I mean, it's the most insane thing ever. But don't worry, don't worry. As long as we all believe it, maybe it'll come true, right? That's what they hope. And so um, the, the, the Fed speak, as they call it, which means the Fed job owns. They, they tell us what they're going to do. They try to move the markets based off of their words alone, not their actions, which, by the way, is a big gripe that I have with most mainstream um, academic economists. There's a lot of uh, academic economists that are much smarter than I am. They, uh, man, they can talk with this Fed speak so well, and they can get into the intricacies of the, 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 the inner working, the plumbing of the financial system and talk about the yield curve controls, and they can talk about the reverse repo, and they can talk about the euro dollar market. They can talk about all these things. Um, they can give you all this Fed speak, and they can give you these what I call factually correct answers, but while they're intellectually dishonest or misleading. And so, for example, one thing they would tell you is they would say, um, so look, the Fed has no effect because look, they said they were going to do something, but, but, but look, here's the numbers. They didn't even do anything and the market moved. So why did the market move when they didn't do anything? And I said, well, because they said they were going to do something, which is what I'm calling Fed speak. So there's direct and indirect movements. And so by them just saying they're going to do something can also do something. So uh, beware of these, uh, these uh, very, very smart academic economists who can mislead you with their terminology. Like, for example, they'll tell you that quantitative easing by the central bank is not inflationary uh, because it doesn't actually push money into the market. And consumer prices didn't go up, um, but... But asset prices did. But, but asset prices aren't included into the consumer price in, inflation. So it, asset prices going up is appreciation. It's not inflation. There's a difference there. <sighs> Look, come on. We can get into that, and, and I'm happy to break that down for you. But that doesn't matter to you. You're trying to put food on your table. You're trying to put gas in your car. You want to know, what does this mean? <laughs> what effect is it going to have on my life? How do I navigate this properly? And that's what I'm trying to kind of help break this down for you without all of this uh, economic mumbo jumbo that's mis misleading. Uh, but we can see, like I said, the, the stocks are moving down. Bitcoin's moving down because they believe that the Fed is going to have to um, overreact. They're going to have to move even way harder, way faster than they were before. So what does that mean for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? Let's just jump in there. So um, Bitcoin has been trading like a tech stock. It's not, it's not a tech stock but it's been trading like a tech stock. So it's been moving in lockstep with the NASDAQ, if you look at it that way, um, whereas the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 have been trading completely different. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you go back and look at some charts, very simple, uh, you can see that the peak, the, all -time, uh, the, the recent all-time high, with, uh, uh, the, the all-time high in the NASDAQ was the same as the all-time high with Bitcoin back in November of 2021. But the peak in the S&P 500 wasn't until January, about two months later, month and a half. So what happened? Well, what we can see is that uh, Bitcoin and, uh, and the NASDAQ risk off as risk on assets or risk on is when risk when those assets do good. Um, we, we can see that the market has been treating Bitcoin and NASDAQ together and they are like the canary in the coal mine. So in November, as soon as the Fed started talking about raising rates, they both went down. But the S&P 500 didn't actually go down until January, a couple months later. So the, the, the risky assets, the, the Bitcoin, the NASDAQ, are very sensitive to this. And why is that important to understand? Well, it's important to understand because they could also probably have the reversal before the S&P 500. So they're the canary in the canola mine, this leading indicator. So uh, it looks like the Fed is going to have to overreact even more than what they had planned on overreacting by, which is why we saw them take a dip based off of this high CPI number. Everyone's expecting them to do much more. But the other thing is that what this probably also does is the Fed had been projecting to raise their rates through 2023. And I think this new news could change their entire, what they call their dot plop, and we might see them actually get their rates raised much sooner than they had originally projected, which would also mean that 
if they r finished raising rates by sooner than they predicted, then they would also stop raising rates sooner than they, than they projected, which means we might see the bottom of Bitcoin and risk assets like the NASDAQ sooner than we had expected. Hmm, that's a good sign. So let's talk about that. When is that going to happen? What are the signs showing me that? And what could happen based off of that? I want to talk about that and more in a minute. Uh, you are listening to The Mark Moss Show. We're talking about the decentralized revolution. We're talking about the way the world is changing. Um, and we're looking at it through the lens of Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies. We're talking about the geopolitics and the macroeconomics. Of course, we're talking about the CPI, the new, the high level 9.1 CPI number that came out this week and what happened with Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and the tech stocks. So um, the CPI is a lie. Uh, it came in way higher than they wanted. Uh, the feds vowed to get it back down. Uh, they've overreacted. They've already been acting way heavier than they had anticipated. Um, but yet it's not having any adjustment. The number came in this week and it's even higher. Um, so now what's going to happen? Well, the markets kind of crashed down a little bit. Bitcoin, NASDAQ crashed down a little bit because they're now saying, well, shoot, the Fed's going to have to way overreact. And now they're going to come in even way hotter. They could potentially come in with a hundred basis point hike. What? A hundred basis point hike. Now, what does that mean? A hundred basis points? Well, uh, it's stupid. People use these words to try to sound all smart. Um, 100 basis points is one point or one percent. <laughs> uh, so it's helpful if you're trying to talk about real small numbers. Uh, for most of us, it might just be easier to say, you know, one percent. So 100 basis points could be uh, one percent. Um, so where would that put us? Well, that'd put us up pretty high. Right now, we're at about 1.75. So that pushes all the way up to like 2.75, um, which could then push the two year and the 10 year up to dare I say, you know, 4%? Boy, I don't know. I don't know if it can go that high. Uh, the Fed funds at 1.75. Uh, if it gets up to 2.75, that's a 100 point basis move. Gets up, call it, call it, call it rounding off to three. At 3%, that means the, the interest only on the government debt, we have about $31 trillion in debt. So at 3% rate means that the interest on the debt would be about a trillion dollars per year, about a trillion dollars. That's just for the interest, which means that the interest owed on the debt would be about 30% of the revenue of the government. So 30% of the revenue would go just to interest only on the debt. Now, that's interest only on the debt. Now, there's lots of other debt. I mean, there's about $200 trillion of what they call unfunded liabilities. So that's debt, that's money that's owed, and it hasn't been funded yet. <laughs> so like uh, pensions and Medicare, Medicaid, like things like that. Um, there's other things that the government has to pay for, obviously, all types of welfare programs and housing programs and military spending and M Medicare, Medicaid, we can, we can go on. Um, and so um, a lot of people would listen to this and go, well, hang on, my house is 30% of my income, what's the big deal? Yeah, but that means the other 60% of, of that income is yours to spend as you want. So that's pretty good. But that's not the case with the government. The government is already running in a deficit, meaning they're already spending more than they're making. So it's a big problem. So uh, yeah, 100 point basis move that could happen. Now, um, as I was saying before the break, I was talking about how Bitcoin and, and tech stocks like the NASDAQ had trade in advance of the S&P 500. They start to price this in. They're way more sensitive to this. And so they started, um, as soon as the Fed said they were going to start raising rates in November, Bitcoin and the NASDAQ sold off. Well, S&P 500 didn't sell off till January. Now, um, now we're seeing that um, because the Fed now has to overreact, instead of raising rates through March of 2023, it looks like maybe they could reach their point of uh, raising rates by, before the end of the year because they're going to be that aggressive now. And they're going to be that aggressive, which is then going to crash the market down, that then they'll pivot. Now, the, the reason why that's important for us to understand is because when they decide to come off of those raising rates, that's when the markets will probably start doing, the risk assets will start doing good again. So um, look, it's impossible for us to time the markets, um, but it doesn't stop us from trying <laughs> and speculating. And so these are things that we're looking at. Now, another thing that we can look at is, uh, 
couple because there's all kinds of indicators. One indicator that's uh, I don't I don't use a lot, but it's interesting to look at is the search term for quote unquote Bitcoin crash is trending. And uh, why? <laughs> what does that mean? So uh, one tool that's very helpful is uh, you can look at Google search terms and you can see what people are searching for. And this shows market sentiment. And so we can see that the term for people are searching on Google for Bitcoin crash and it's it's uh, it's trending really high. Now, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's been marked dead at least 458 times since 2009. So every time Bitcoin crashes by 30, 40%, everybody loves to come out and say it's dead. So it's been dead, it's been declared dead um, over 450 times. Um, but of course, every time that's happened, it, it obviously hasn't been. Now, last year, the word crypto was trending all over the internet because the crypto market was going up. So everybody heard everyone's making all this money, everyone's getting rich, and uh, people are like, what the heck is this crypto thing? And they're Googling crypto, crypto, crypto. Um, and as it was going up, that was a good thing. But now they're not, they're not Googling that. Now they're, they're, they're Googling Bitcoin crash um, because, of course, we're going into a bear market. And we can see it's trending again, uh, like I said, according to the, the data from Google Trends. Now, as far as why did it crash, we've talked about this extensively, um, but this is kind of a uh, indicator. And so we're trying to gauge market sentiment. And so when the whole market starts to think something is going down, typically it starts to go back up. Now, one thing, as I said, it's important to try to time the market, um, but uh, it's impossible to time the market, but we still look at a couple things. So there's a couple indicators that we look at. There's all types of indicators. I'll throw out a couple real quick at you. Um, and they're showing that now might be a pretty good time. Um, there's one that's called the pie cycle bottom indicator. And the indicator comprises a 471 day simple moving average SMA. So it basically smooths it out um, over like a, four, a little over four years and a 150 period exponential moving average. Uh, and then it multiplies it, it's a little bit complicated by 0 0.745. And the outcome is then compared against the 150 day moving average to predict when the market's underlying bottom is. Now, and that's a little bit complicated, uh, but just know that each time the 150 period EMA has fallen below the 471 period, it has marked the, the end of a Bitcoin bear market. Now, this worked really well in 2015. The crossover coincided with the Bitcoin bottoming at, at, at only $160 back then. I started buying in 2015, not that cheap, it was about $300. Um, that was in January of 2015, uh, followed by an almost 12,000% bull run towards 20,000. I got to participate, participate in that. That was pretty awesome. Um, we saw it happen a second time. Um, the 150 um, and the 471 crossover happened again at the end of the 2018 bear cycle. And then it followed a 2000% price rally from about 3,200 in December up to 69,000 November, 2021. So this, uh, we're seeing it happen again for only the third time in history. Um, the third pie cycle bottom in history um, happens right around the 20,000 mark. And it's after a 75% plus price correction from its peak of $69,000. Does that mean we could be at the bottom? Well, it might be about that time, seeing as Bitcoin, the NASDAQ is going to pivot off of this news of the Fed predicting when they will stop raising rates, which has now been moved up from 2023 all the way till maybe the end of 2022. But that's just what uh, these indicators tell us. But what do you think? I'd love to hear from you. Hit me up on social media at one Mark Moss. You've been listening to the Mark Moss show talking about um, the Fed, CPI, raising rates, the decentralized resolution, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and more. Everything you need to stay up to date. Um, if you missed any of this, catch it out on the podcast network. Just search Mark Moss Podcast or the Mark Moss Show on your favorite podcast app. And that's what I got for today. Thanks for listening. Since you've stayed to the end, I know you like this video, which means you're probably going to really like this video right here and this video right here.